tribe of Manasseh, and they also got cities in there. And they were allowed then to have a portion of the things that were uh, given to God as far as their food goes. They also had cows and, and livestock that, that they were uh, ascribed to them, but they didn't get a large territory to call their own. In chapter 22, we see the tribes were given their return blessing. Joshua says, hey, you've helped us. We, we attacked and killed all the armies that have been in front of us. You may go back to your homes. And remember, when you bring the spoils, to do what? Share. You know, so as we have kids, right? We tell our kids, hey, share, right? Share, right? Um, so, yeah, they'll have to, uh, they have to share with those because there was only 40,000 of them as far as the fighting men who came. There was probably another 65 fighting men that stayed and protected all the homes there while they were gone. So they made sure, Joshua told them, hey, when you go over there, make sure you share with the others. And, of course, they had that small little disagreement about what the altar meant or didn't mean. And, right, we got it all worked out. And that's not, we were not ascribing ourselves to, to leaving, right, or being not a part of the nation. Joshua tells the leaders... And everyone, all their tribes, I'm going to go away. I'm getting old. I'm about to, to go the way of the world and, and pass away. And reminds them to do what? Follow God. Now, Moses gave that same in Deuteronomy. Hey, remember to follow God's co covenant. Remi remember to follow God's command. Joshua, remember to follow his command. Because he, the famous line that we sing also, as for me and... We will, and they said, why does Israel have such a short memory? Is that like today? Do we have short memories? We're human. We do have short memories, it seems. You know, you know as we get older, we think of that short-term and long-term memory loss. I can remember, you know, my, my household phone number when I was a child, but I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning or what I read this morning. Yes. So, some, sometimes, right. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Uh, do I turn on this street? It's Lake Luther. I should turn on that street, right? Yeah, don't go to Timber Ridge where our first house was. Yes. And then they went to Shechem, and the covenant was reestablished with them. And, of course, we look at the amount of land that they have. You know, here's, again, I cut that line in half, the north side and south side. But God had given them more. Right? They had given him more, and he says, hey, you'll expand by three territories if you do what? And what do you have to do? Push them out. Push them out right? All those inhabitants, now they, they destroyed all the armies, but there's still people there. You have to push them out. And God told him, hey, you're not going to do this all at once. We're going to do this little by little and make sure that you have all the territory that's ascribed to you, and as you expand your territory... Because if you don't drive them out, what's the theme? They're going to be a thorn in your side, right? So the Israelites possessed the land of Canaan under the leadership of Joshua. And, of course, he told them, keep going, right? Don't stop. They all have good intentions. But what did Moses also tell them? Let's just look back a couple chapters to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verses 2 through 6. And then I'll just start at verse 1. When Jehovah thy God shall bring thee unto the land, whither thou goest to possess us, and shall cast out many nations before thee, the Hittite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when Jehovah thy God shall deliver them up before thee, and thou shalt smite them, then thou shalt utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. Did that already happen? Yeah. They were deceived, right? Nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For he will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of Jehovah be kindled against you, and he will destroy thee quickly. But thus say ye deal with them. Ye shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and hew down their asherim 
and burn their graven images with fire. Because what's going to happen? They're going to fall away, right. And this is, it, it seems just a single generation. And like we look at the generations, the wandering in the wilderness, that generation's gone. This next generation that God has helped build, he's talking about the next generation after Joshua and all the elders pass away. We see in Joshua's chapter 11 that the land promise, you have now possessed the land. All you have to do is what? All you have to do is obey God. All you have to do. It didn't seem like a big thing, right? All we have to do today is what? All we have to do, a little thing, right? It seems like a little thing, but it seems it's going to be a big stumbling block for them. And Joshua did what before he, he left, right? Set this task before them. In, in that last chapter of Joshua, Joshua chapter 23, verses 15 and 16. Joshua 23, 15 and 16. Jerry, do you mind reading that for me? the past that as all the good things have come upon you which the Lord your God promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things until he has destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. Thank you. And what did they answer? What did they say? Well, we were going to do what? Everything God had told us. We will do all these things. We will make sure that we do all these things. We're going to listen to God, and all we have to do is we don't have any big armies. we just got to push these people out of the land. And they had the warnings. They knew what was going to happen if they didn't. They knew that they weren't going to take the full possession. But it seems after Joshua and the elders were gone, they didn't have that, that focal leadership. And some of them complained that, hey, they're living within our borders and Joshua even heard him complain, hey, we're so large, we need more territory. Well, go and take it. Go and take it. Well, as we begin the period of the Judges, we see a kind of recurrent theme. It happens about 15 times in the Bible. Now, we know the period of Judges spans about 300 years. And the starting point, you know, just like a lot of, a lot of um, you know, scholars, the starting point of when it begins, the time period's a little vague, which are 1366, 1341, you know, around ending 1060, 1020 B.C. These are roughly when it starts or when it ends. But this would be the period. Now, the first judge we kind of already have seen, right? We already got introduced in Joshua, right? Who is Othniel? Who was he? Who's son-in-law? Caleb. Caleb. Caleb's son-in-law. Yes, right. And he was also the son of his brother. And we know that he became his son-in-law because he helped do what? He helped fight out the giants, the sons of Anak in Hebron. And so Joshua gave his daughter for him to wife. Now, Typically, we're not sure exactly who wrote the book of Judges. It's traditionally ascribed to Samuel or one of his disciples. But it doesn't say like we have other books and said, okay, this is who wrote the book. This is who wrote the text. So we really, you know, um, go with, okay, it may have been Samuel. Now, you know, living in a neighborhood, and we have different people that live in our neighborhood, we try and get along. And that's what the Israelites were doing, right? They were trying to get along. But what God had told them in Deuteronomy when Moses had said it, don't get along, don't have mercy on them, don't make covenants with them, don't give your children to their um, children, don't have your wives or sons be, be uh, married to them because you're going to do what when you have in-laws, right? We, if we have in-laws, we're all trying to get along, right? And they started tolerating and then accepting the Baal worship and the Ashtaroth. What was one of God's commandments to that? You'll have no other God before me. And that's still true today, right? That's still true today. That holds true for all of us today. And God is a jealous God, yes. And he had Moses tell him, don't do it. He had Joshua tell him, don't do it. 
He told it all the elders and all the leaders of all the tribes, don't do it. They did. And as we look at the first couple chapters, first chapter one and two, you know, we look at things in chronological order. You know, we think the Bible should be chronological. We know it's not. And we even the book of Judges kind of overlaps a little bit. And when we look at the period of the Judges or the Judges in there, you know, before we knew, okay, the kings to the northern and who was contemporaries and kings to the south and who were their contemporaries. And when we look at the period of the Judges, there are some Judges that seem to overlap each other because we talk about you know, one judge attacking those to the east side and one attacking the Philistines or the coastline. And so we see that some of this, some of the judges will overlap their time periods. Um, and we see that re whole recurrent theme when they said, well, we're going to follow God. We have a tendency to then forget that. And as next generation comes up and can we predict what's going to happen if they fall away from God? God said, I'm going to be angry. God said, I'm going to punish you. And I'm going to allow those around you to, to, to do that. But didn't they always say, we will do all God has said? And that's even true today. We will do all that God has said as children of God, right? And when... Joshua told them, hey, you just need to go up and push out the Canaanites. They were like, well, who's going to be our leader? Who's going to take the lead because Joshua's not here? Who's going to fight for us? And now turn to Judges chapter 1. Who did they ask? Who was going to do that? Who did it say? Well, okay, Judges chapter 1, 1 through 4, the children of Israel asked, who's going to fight against the Canaanites? And the tribe of Judah said, we will. And also, who's, who's within the territory of the tribe of Judah? Simeon, right? So Simeon, their, their brother, said, okay, we will fight as well. We will go up and we will start driving these out. And they found a certain king, right? Right, and, and his, his city or where he was was north of their territory. But they went up and found this king. And what did they do to this king? Well, he ran away, he hid, but they found him, right? And he cut off their thumbs and his big toes? Yeah, but what did he say he did? Same thing. How many of them? Seventy. Yeah, three score and ten. So I've already done that to 70 other kings, so I guess God's given me back what I deserve. And then what happened to him? Where did he die? Jerusalem. Right. He died in Jerusalem. So we look at when we look at the city where it was, because we know, and we see the small box down at the bottom there, you can see the, the Dead Sea and, and the, uh, I mean, the, and the Jordan River there. And so the area where his city was, and that's B-E-Z-E-K, Bezek. And so that was north of their territory. And then in verse 8, the children of Israel went to Jerusalem, which was on their way back, right? But now, this city wasn't in Judah's territory or Simeon's. Jerusalem, was it in their tribal territory? No, it was in the tribe of Benjamin's territory. And it says they burnt the city down. But what do we know about those who lived in Jerusalem? What, what were they called? Jebusites. And did the tribe of Benjamin, what did they do? Did they drive them out? No, so after they burned the city, I guess they came back into the city and Benjamin didn't drive them out because we find who finally drives out the Jebusites? David. David. So we don't even get to that for a long time. And the children of Judah then fought after they fought those in Jerusalem in 9 and 10. We'll read that. And afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the hill country. And in the south and in the low country, remember, this is a contour, right? We have the coastline, we have the middle areas, and then we have the higher elevations, you know, right before you cross over. If you look at this kind of map, it's not so typographical, but if you see the green, those are the hills, and then the valley down into the Jordan. So we have these hill countries, and we have the low countries. And then Judah went up against Canaanites that dwell in Hebron. Well, who was Hebron's possession? 
Caleb. And then there's also one of the cities of the Levites. So remember, this is some of the things that they've already, you know, we've already seen done in Joshua's time. So that's why it kind of overlaps a little bit. And this is the same, it reiterates the same thing that we saw in Joshua 15, that Caleb says, hey, there's the giants up there. We're going to go ahead and, and I want uh, someone to, uh, you know, wipe them out. And Othniel said, I will. And when he did, he, Caleb gave him his daughter to wife. And then remember what his, his daughter asked of Caleb. Springs, right? And he granted her the springs, uh, uh, one to the north, one to the south of the springs, right? And, and so we see these same stories and battles occur in the period of Judges as we did in Joshua's time. And we look here on our map again, and we see where Jerusalem, Jerusalem is, and we see Hebron further south. And so Hebron is remember, within the confines of the tribe of Judah's territory. Now, we get a side note here in chapter 1. We get Moses, he had a brother-in-law, and they came with them, right? He convinced them long ago to go with them. And when he got there, he said, hey, we're going we're gonna to settle in the territory of Judah. And they came from and would get introduced to the city of Palms, and that's kind of an interesting note because that was where Jericho was laid waste. Remember, we couldn't build up the city of Jericho, but near there we have the city of Palms. And then the children of Judah, then after they fought those in Hebron and the Canaanites, and we see now in chapter 1, verses 17 and 19, and Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they smote the Canaanites and inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormath. Also Judah took Gaza, which the border thereof, and Ashkelon, with the border thereof, and Ekron, with the border thereof. And Jehovah was with Judah, and drove out the inhabitants of the hill country, for he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valleys, because they had chariots of iron. So we look at these territories that we just talked about. We looked about where Hebron was. Remember, that was south of Jerusalem. Well, Hormath was even way further south than that. We saw them also take over some of the other territories within in now that their, their portion or their inhabitants, but they couldn't drive them all out because they had chariots of iron. Didn't they also have a battle in Joshua's time where they had the northern kingdom or got together, but they had the chariots of iron. Didn't God help them fight them? Yes. So we don't know about that battle, if they did have the battle or just chose not to. And so I just talked about, you know, the children of Benjamin, and we have a list now of all the rest of the tribes saying, hey, we couldn't drive out these inhabitants. We couldn't drive out these inhabitants. We couldn't drive out these inhabitants. And they're living with us today. Well, the Jebusites was one of those, and we find those in Jerusalem like we talked about. And David was the one who finally conquered the Jebusites. And Jehovah was with them when they went against Bethel, which is the Benjamite tribe. And we see that in 22 through 25. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel. And Jehovah was with them. And the house of Joseph sent out Bethel, spies, and the watchers saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will deal kindly with thee. Well, he showed them the entrance of the city. What did they do? Destroyed it, right. He took over the city, right. But they couldn't draw, drive out the, the Jebusites. Jehovah helped them against the, those in Bethel. And we see the territory of Benjamin, right? Go right below that, if we see it, is Judah. And Simeon's within there. So Benjamin was just to their north. And they had the territory... They had the territory all the way to the Jordan River and then stretched out to, to Dan's territory. And then the rest of the chapter talks about the other tribes not being able to drive out the Canaanites. And we know that this is going to be what? 
a big mistake, right? A big mistake. And God had told them, this is, you, have, you, you have one job. What was their job? Drive out the inhabitants that are dwelling among you. Why? Because it's going to be a, it's going to be a snare. It's going to be a trap. It's going to be a thorn in your side. And so we see these big forces and the big territories and it says, okay, hey, we weren't able to drive these out. We weren't able to drive these out. And the Amorites, we see in the last portion of chapter 1, forced the children of Dan into the hill country. Verses 34 through 36. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the hill country, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres, and Ajalon, and say Albim. Yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed, so that they became subject to task work. And the border of the Amorites was from the ascent of Acrabim, from the rock and upward. And so we see they're still allowing them to stay there. And this is going to be a problem for all of them. Because in verse, in chapter 2, who comes to speak to the children of Israel? The angel. And did he speak good things? Hey, you're doing a great job. No, why were they displeased? They, 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 didn't, they didn't do what they were told to do, right? And then what was their reaction to hearing, hey, we're not doing what God had said. The angel Jehovah just came to us and said, hey, we're not doing our job. They were weeping, right? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. But this caused a change in their behavior. Did they do things different? Did they go out and drive out the Canaanites? No, they still lived with them. They still lived with them. The Canaanites still dwelt within their territories. And in chapter 2, we kind of go over the same thing that we saw in the end of Joshua, that he dies. And how old was Joshua again when he died? 110. He was 110. He was, he was quite old, yes. A ripe old age. On in years. And then is buried in the territory that was given to his portion. And all the time that he was alive... And then the elders that were with him, the children of Israel did what? Right. So then this time that, this, that they didn't must have been after that time because it said they were following Jehovah up until this time. And now we see in verses 11 through 15 in chapter 2, And the children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of Jehovah, and served the Baalim, and they forsook Jehovah, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods. And the gods of the peoples that were round about them and bowed themselves down unto them. And they provoked Jehovah to anger. And they forsook Jehovah and served Baal and the Ashtaroth. And the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that despoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could, no, could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithsoever they went out, the hand of Jehovah was against them for evil. As Jehovah had spoken and as Jehovah had sworn unto them, they sore distressed. They were told, if you don't follow God, if you don't listen to my commandments... I'm going to be angry. I'm going to raise these people up and they are going to come and, and then cause problems with you. Now, we start seeing the beginning of this cycle. Chapter 2 talks about this. So what did they first do? Uh, other idols, right. They, they had apostasy, right? They fell away. They started worshiping other idols and gods that were around about them. You know, those that they were living with them. And then God was angry with them and brought up what? Their enemies, built them up, gave them confidence, I guess, to then start oppressing them. Well, what did the nation of Israel then do? Well, yeah, they go, okay, we're, we're, we, we, didn't what we, we didn't do what we're supposed to do. And we started crying out to God that we need to turn back to God. Now, that's a theme today, too. We need to turn back to God. 
So in verse 16, what would God do after he heard his people, after they said we were distressed, after they cried out to him and they wanted to repent and turn back to God? Jehovah still was, I'm a loving God, right? I still love, his, love my people. I still want them to be my people. So he raised up a who? Judge. Now, we think of judges today like a little bit different, right? They're not in a court of law. They're not lawyers, right? This is a judge or a leader who God had appointed. He was now going to appoint them, and they were going to distress or bring about a change of their enemies and attack them. Jehovah raises up these judges who saved them out of the hand of those that despoiled them. And yet they hearkened not unto their judges, for they played the harlot after other gods and bowed themselves down to them. They turned aside quickly out of the way, whether in their fathers walked, obeying the commandments of Jehovah, but they did not so. And when Jehovah raised them up judges, then Jehovah was with the judge and saved them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented Jehovah because of their groaning by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. But it came to pass, when the judge was dead, they turned back and dwelt, dealt, excuse me, dealt more corruptly than their fathers. In following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them, they ceased not from their doings nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of Jehovah was kindled against Israel. And he said, Because this nation have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I will also not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations that Joshua, when he had died. They that them that I prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of Jehovah to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. So Jehovah left those nations without driving them out hastily. Neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So we see they fell away. We see that God's anger burned against them and he raised up their enemies. Their enemies oppressed them. And after a period of time, they cried back to God as to being oppressed just like they did in Egypt. Now, just like they doing here in their, their land, which they should have been able to possess and have a time of peace. Then God raises up a judge, and they were faithful during what? Just his lifetime. Again, a single generation. And then when that judge who God was with, who had oppressed their enemies and drove them out, dies, they seem to turn back into the same thorn, the same catch, that same problem. And God had told them, I am not going to drive out these people from among you. They were put there to prove that you are my children and that you are going to follow my ways. And you didn't do that because what was one of the things they said he was? They were a stubborn and hard-hearted. We've heard that before, hard-hearted people. And so for the next period of time that we go through the period of judges, we have that recurrent theme. Yes, sir. As a teenager, we moved to Arkansas. And there, instead of having county commissioners, they had county judges. But they didn't wear robes and preside over trial. They were just, they ran the county government. And then later, I read the biography of Terry Truman, and his first political office was that of a county judge, the same kind that had an Arkansas county commissioner. But that is a little misleading when we first read about these judges, and uh, they weren't judges as we normally think of judges. Right, and it also wasn't a lineage thing like we see later when we go through the kings. It wasn't that, you know, Joshua's son became the next judge or Caleb's son. Uh, it was his son-in-law that became the first judge. And then Othniel's son didn't become the next judge. It wasn't a lineage thing. Um, and God was supposed to appoint these. And we'll find someone who just kind of, you know, assumed the role. It wasn't really appointed by God. 
but we see that same period and the same thing going through. And, and we look at, you know, the judges as we were going to see them, and they are kind of split off. If you look at Bob Waldron's text, too, he calls it early judges and later judges. And so the early judges, Othiel, Ehud, Samgar, Deborah, Gideon, Abimelech. That was an interesting order. Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, Samson, Eli, and the last judge was Samuel. Right. And we see this pattern now in this in described in chapter two. But we also see in contrast, you know, God's plan for us and what why we may transgress. But we see the same thing, the apostasy, the transgression. They turned away from God. They allowed the other people around them to pull them away. Hey, we have family relationships. We're just going to go, we're just going to go with them to their church. Or we're going to go with them, and, and it would be you know, bad. We're still going to worship Jehovah, but you know, on, on these other days, we're going we're gonna to do this. And then God was angry with him, right? Because you're going to not have any other gods before me. And so he brought up their enemies. We see them... Oh, we're crying out to God. We want to turn back. We want to repent. You hopefully have a change of heart. God brings up this judge, and they have deliverance. And then they have a period of time of peace. A lot of times it's about 40 years. Sometimes it's 80 years, depending. But after that period of time, we see that period of peace, which was described in Judges chapter 2. But let's turn over to the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 2 and just read that contrast that we see for us today. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And did you, and you did he make alive when ye were dead through your trespasses and sins, wherein ye once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also were once, lived in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, for his great love wherewithin he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye have been saved and raised us up with him and made us to sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in the kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace have ye been saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works that no man should glory, for we are his workmanship, creating in Christ Jesus for good works, which God afore prepared that we should walk in them. And so we see that contrast, right? We were transgressed before we became Christians. We didn't follow his past before we were Christians. And now the reason we have that hope is with God. And his past. Well, the nation of Israel also had that same past from him. And I have a friend that I went to uh, Kenya with. His name is uh, Darren Brackett. And he also did a historical um, survey of the Old Testament. And within his, he has a little bit different um, ascribed outline for this same period of judges that Bob does. So I just thought I'd share it with you. But the same cycle of sin from the children of Israel... The Israelites do evil. What was their evil? They followed other gods. And God allows them to become captives of their enemies. Then the Israelites repent and cry out to God for help. God has love for us, for his children, and raises up a judge and a deliverer. The judge, God's deliverer, then kills the enemy leader and, and allows that enemy, enemy to be placed into his hands. And the land has rest and peace under the judge during his leadership and his time alive. So it's only a short period of time. It's only one generation. But it seems the, the children of Israel don't seem to pass that on to the next generation. Remember in Deuteronomy, 
right? We were supposed to teach our children, right? When we're at home, when we're walking by the way, when we're, right, we're supposed to pass that information along, right? It seems that being God's children is only one generation away from being severed. If we don't pass that along to the next generation and that generation to come, right, Tabitha? Which is very close now, very, very close. It's, it's, it's getting to be real, it's getting to be real. That next generation, all of us who have grandchildren, you know, that next generation of children and grandchildren, right? And we see now starting in chapter 3, and we'll just begin that before we, we finish here, that they just through, went through a period of oppression. They just had this happen. God just heard from them, and he was about to raise up a judge so that they can then have peace again in the land. Now these are the nations with Jehovah left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel, Israel as had known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before time knew nothing thereof, namely the five lords of the Philistines. Now, we know Philistines, right? This is going to be a thorn in their side for time to come. Remember who David had to fight them and push them out. They even went as far as a, we, we got the Ark of the Covenant for a short period of time. And all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in the mountain Lebanon from Mount Baal el Hermon unto the entrance of Hamath. And they were left to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of Jehovah, which he commanded their fathers by Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their own daughters to their sons, and served their gods. God had told them not to do this. God had told them that this was going to be a following and a problem. God told them that these are here to prove that you're his people by driving them out. Well, we'll see next time as we go through the rest of chapter 3. I appreciate everybody's kind attention. 40 minutes seem to go by very quickly. I appreciate, appreciate you very much and your attention.